Welcome to A Friend of Mine, a series of conversations with some incredible and inspiring women in business from regional and rural Australia. I'm Kimberly Finesse, your host and the founder and editor of Oak Magazine, and I cannot wait to introduce you to some amazing female entrepreneurs who will share with you their experience and knowledge of what it takes to start, grow and scale a successful business. So let me introduce you to A Friend of Mine. Brooke McCallery, the internationally best-selling author of Slow, has just released a new book titled Care, The Radical Art of Taking Time. This book was created out of necessity during the height of the global pandemic at a time when care seemed most important in our lives. If you look back over the past 18 months, there has been an overwhelming nature of big care. The Black Summer bushfires, COVID-19, Black Lives Matter protests, the US election, 2020 has been a time of so many enormous, overwhelming problems facing the world and, as human beings, we have cared about them all. In 2020, Brooke burnt out. She discovered she cared too much about the big care. It was also the year she discovered she cared too little about the small care. In her new book, Brooke focuses on smaller, personal acts of care, ones that can be achieved and are accessible no matter your socioeconomic status or social background. And you can't say you don't have time. As the acts are broken down into half a minute, half an hour and half a day or more, it really is an incredible book. From her home in the Southern Highlands, Brooke talks to us about her experience of feeling incredible loneliness, postnatal depression, small acts of care and her concept of tilting instead of balancing. We also bond over our love of Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon and, more seriously, how that relates back to community. Meet my friend Brooke, author of Care. Hello, Brooke, and welcome to the podcast. Hello, and thank you. It's lovely to be here. You're welcome. I'm so glad to have you. And um, I've got you just uh, as you have launched your new book. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's fresh into the world. Oh, exciting. Uh, So obviously I got a um, a sneaky peek at your book thanks to Laura from Allen and Unwin. Uh, She sent me a copy. Now I have this thing where I talk to friends about six degrees of Kevin Bacon (laughs) and I have to explain to them what I mean. Now I opened up your book and here you are talking about six degrees of Kevin Bacon. I'm just like, oh, kindred spirit. Oh my gosh, I love this person already. <laughs> <laughs> when I wrote that, I'm like, no one will pick up what I'm putting down right here. Like, this is the randomest thing I could have put in a book. <laughs> so, you know what? Success. I feel great now. Oh my gosh, I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, so, you've got a bacon number four. Was that yes, right? That's right. Yeah. Yes. Do you know what yours is? I think so. I have a second cousin. Yeah. Who done the makeup for Kiefer Sutherland? Okay. Who was in a few Good Men with Kevin Bacon? Oh my God! So what? Yours is three or two? Oh my God! I'm close to Kevin. You are. See, yep. this is it. This is the magic, the glory of the bacon. I love um, him. I, lo- I love him too. I yeah. think he's wonderful. Um, so I guess for people who don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> It's the six degrees of separation thing, but it's a game, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. And you like the, I, I think it originated as take one celebrity and try and see how many links it takes to get to Kevin Bacon. And there's an actual website called the Oracle of Bacon, um, which does it for you. It's really fun. It was, uh, yes, it was. It was yeah. brilliant. But that's also the thing because it, it works back into regional and rural. Like this is what I love about li- living in a regional town. Um, it is because there are only, you know, sometimes one or two degrees of separation between you and another person. So you go to events or you're talking to someone and you go, oh, do you know such and such? And generally it'll be through a friend of a friend. So that's sort of how you create that community as well. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's why I used the Kevin Bacon thing in the book was because I was talking about connection. Um, and initially I was talking about, you know, the internet and how we're all so like, we're a few clicks away from any piece of information, any person, uh, that we could potentially want to touch into. And 
uh, you know, it's, that has its drawbacks, obviously, but it also has its positives. But I live in a small country town as well. And I agree with you that it's that really sort of fragile almost, um, you know, webs of, of connection. And if you're aware of them, if you're willing to open yourself up to them, to ask questions, to, you know, just be kind of radiate openness in, in new situations, um, which is something I have always struggled with, you do find that, that tendril, you know, of connection. And I think it's beautiful. It is. Uh, in that chapter, you actually also spoke about just this incredible loneliness that you mm-hmm. felt um, and isolation. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, just knowing that, you know, some of our audience are living remote and rural and probably experience that themselves. Absolutely. Because I think it is such a common problem. Um, there was research that that it's ongoing, but it came out uh, last year during the first sort of big COVID lockdown that spoke about loneliness in Australia. And one in four Australians feel lonely more than 50% of the time. Oh. And two, uh, one in two Australians feel lonely at least one day a week. And to me that when you look at the, the health um, like the the health impacts of loneliness, and there are some researchers that say it's as bad as smoking like fifteen cigarettes um, a day. Wow. <laughs> That's how bad loneliness can yep. be for you. Uh, it's not just you know a personal problem. It's not something we need to feel ashamed about because it is a very common problem, and it's also a public health issue that I think we really need to address. So I'm always happy to talk about loneliness. And it's funny, people assumed that the loneliness that I have experienced only started when we moved to this new town, Uh, but that wasn't the case. I would probably have classified myself as lonely when we lived in a much larger town when my family and friends were nearby than I am here in um, the Southern Highlands. And I think it's been a really interesting sort of process for me to unpack why I've experience that sort of loneliness. And I, I I landed on this sort of place where I'm introverted, right? Um, Like very, very introverted. And I used that as an excuse to not be vulnerable. You know, I'm like, I'm introverted. I don't need lots of close friends. I've got friends who are good friends, but they live far away from me. um, And that's okay. And in fact, that's what I want because I'm introverted and I like my own company. Um, But it's when I realized that it's, it's the more kind of everyday kindnesses that I was missing out on by not radiating openness, as I said before. You know, I, I started to experiment with how to perhaps alleviate some of the worst of that loneliness without trying to go out and find five new best friends and, you know, burn myself out in that way. So I did things like go and work in the local coffee shop and you smile at people yeah. and, you know, you get to know someone's name and you have a chat and you start to feel that that web of community uh you know come into play and then you know we can't do this at the moment because we're not allowed in school grounds but when I when we could I would smile at you know at parents at school pickup or um you know go and help in at the school and 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 volunteer for a day a term and same thing it's it's just sort of building this 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 level of um belonging that I think has really taken away the worst of the loneliness, um, but also allowing myself to be vulnerable, you know, um, and and being proactive to a certain extent in talking to my friends and reaching out to people and not waiting. And I find it's, like, it's quite a complex um, place that I've landed with it uh, in terms of it's tied up with, you know, self-worth and all of that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. But yep. Um, yeah, I think that the more we talk honestly about loneliness, the better. Uh, and I find that with everything, you know, I'm, I'm much, I much prefer to be open and honest with people. Uh, and so often that's all it takes for someone to look at you and say, Hey, me too. And that can lead to lots of different places. It can. And I love that at the end of each chapter of care, you have these really simple ways to implement, say, connection or whatever that core category of that chapter is. And, you know, you've broken them down so cleverly into half a minute, half an hour, 
a day or more. Like it's it's brilliant, Brooke. I and maybe that's just me. I, I love to have something at you know the end of each chapter, and it's like these are the actions that you can actually take away and um, and really easy to implement. You know, it's none of that whole. I don't have time either. Right. You know? And that was that was the whole the whole point of this book in the end was how do I take these ideas of care, you know, and they're really varied, uh, and make them as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. Uh, because uh, I mentioned to you before we started recording, this book started its life as sort of an investigation into what self-care, the industry of self-care had become. Um, and what bugged me the most about it was that it's just not accessible to people. The way it's packaged up and sold is not accessible to the vast majority of us. Either we don't have time, we don't have the money, um, we don't have the access, you know, a multitude of reasons why, why quote, self-care is not available to us. Uh, so when I was writing this book, that was the main thread, was like what can I do in each chapter that opens this idea up to as many people as possible? So I'm really glad that you liked it. I, I absolutely loved it. Loved it. Um, yeah. And <laughs> it's it's one of those things you can just open up to any chapter and, you know, yes. flick to the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm terrible at that. I just don't read books from um, these style books from front to back. It's one of those ones where you flick, stop at a chapter here, and then yep. you almost just go with with where you are in life, how you're feeling, what you need more exactly. of. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, good. I'm really glad that that's where oh. you landed with it. <laughs> <laughs> I do. So, Let's take a couple of steps back. Uh, Tell me, what is your definition of care? Like what are you describing care as being with your book? Yeah, I I think it's a really interesting word, care, because I I mean when I hear the word, or probably before I wrote this book, when I heard the word, I would immediately conjure up some kind of wholesome, gentle image, you know, of a mother and a child or someone caring for their garden or someone who works in aged care and caring for patients or, you know, those sorts of, they're true, they're absolutely true, but they're like one kind of care. And I think COVID last year, you know, April, May, I burnt out massively because I discovered that I was kind of all cared out, if that makes sense. Mm. And I realized that there's this spectrum of care and on one end you've got big care which to me is global issues you know COVID climate change um you know issues of racial injustice and inequality and all of that sort of stuff the really big important global problems that deserve our attention and then on the other end you've got self-care which as we've kind of already covered has its own problems um but definitely has benefits too you know I'm all for meditation and journaling and that kind of stuff. And I thought that there was something missing in the conversation, which was what I've decided to call small care. And that is any kind of act that radiates a sense of, you know, connection or kindness or um, rest or healing or anything, any, any kind of warmth into the world, whether that is self-directed or, other directed. Um, so it's kind of, I don't have a snappy summation of what care means to me um, other than I think we know when we're doing it. Yeah. When you were writing the book, did you have an audience in mind, like a, a target persona or, or anything like that? Um, initially I did. Um, and it was people who were kind of fed up with the idea of self-care uh, as it was being sold to us. But as you know, Black Summer hit when I was halfway through, I guess, writing the first draft and then COVID, obviously. And that changed my entire outlook on what the book was going to become. And I found as I was writing through my own burnout uh, that I was writing it for myself as much as mm-hmm. anyone else. And yep. um, that was actually quite helpful because I got to experiment with some of the ideas that I, I wrote about and discovered that they weren't just helpful, they were really genuinely powerful um, and helped speak to like this tension that I've had for as long as I can remember of understanding that, you know, I, I see huge issues in the world and I want to help enact change in them, but 
also I can't do that if I am exhausted. So it was really helpful for me, I think, to try this stuff out and see that what I was actually able to do was to, you know, to use the overused cliche, fill my own cup and then pour from pour from the excess. And I could actually do more than when I was just trying to, you know, run myself into the ground. Mm. Is there a particular chapter that is your absolute favorite? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think it probably shifts uh, over time, but probably the awe chapter. Yeah. Yeah, I I think there's something really magical in experiencing awe in the world and in ourselves. And, you know, when I went into it, I started thinking about awe-inspiring experiences. So I was thinking like big nature, you know, and – hiking to the top of a mountain or seeing the sunrise over a beautiful beach or uh, like the Grand Canyon, that kind of stuff. Uh, But I realized that there is so much in just normal, everyday, quiet life that is awe-inspiring from, you know, the way our heart pumps or the way that our, you know, our lungs work. And I write in the book about, you know, think about the ingredients in your sandwich next time you, you make one for lunch. And everything that needed to come into being at the exact right time for this thing to exist. Uh, And what awe does for us is it makes us more generous. It makes us more content in, uh, in our lives. It makes us have a completely different relationship with time in that we feel like there's more of it. So, yeah, I think that that's something that we can always tap into regardless of what else is going on in our lives. And, you know, feel the benefits of it. Mm. I think there's just something incredible about um, just going outside, especially when you live in the country, to be able to look up and see the stars. um, Absolutely. Sort of something you miss when you're living in the city um, or don't even know about living in the city. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. When we moved here, I mean, I knew, I knew that it would be clearer, but I had no idea how milky the Milky Way (laughs) is, you know. (laughs) We don't do that stuff enough. No, I I agree. I think that we're brought up on this myth of, you know, endless productivity and even our downtime should be productive or um, attractive or, you know, we're just, we're just not, we're not given examples of what it looks like to simply just be, to rest, Mm -hmm. to allow things to not get done. Um, But we need that, you know, for so many reasons. We absolutely need to give ourselves the opportunity to be quiet and to feel our feelings and to think our thoughts and to get to know our, you know, our really rich inner world. Because as you say, all that superfluous stuff, it just takes us away from, you know, from the the self-inquiry or the, that, that kind of quiet joy of, of looking at the stars, you know, yeah. or, or, looking for four leaf clovers or you know whatever it is such a childhood thing to do totally yeah yep now care is not your first book um I mean some people may know you from slow which was incredibly successful um has there been any pressure for you to sort of follow up on the success of slow um not certainly not any external pressure at all. Uh, I'm really lucky to have worked with a team at Alan and Unwin who were like, just let us know when you've got something you think is worth exploring and we'll go from there. And that took me after writing slow, I actually didn't know that I would be able to write another nonfiction book. <laughs> it took me about 18 months to go, okay, maybe I can. I've got another one go in again. Me. Yeah, yep. exactly. It's like kind of like childbirth maybe. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but, oh, I think the pressure, the only pressure that I put on myself was to see how I could re, not even reframe, how I could come at the ideas, like the core ideas of, of slow living, but from a place that seems more accessible to people, because I think slow living has suffered a bit of the same fate that self-care has in that, you know, a lot of people are really enthusiastic about it, which is brilliant, but 
hot on the heels of that is people trying to figure out how do we market this and how do we, you know, tie it up in a nice little bow and give the do's and the don'ts of slow living and, you know, the must-haves and the do-not-owns of slow living. And that's sort of the antithesis of, of slow to me. So I still firmly believe in the the core ideas of slow, but I wanted, like I sort of challenged myself, I guess, as I was rewriting the book to, to look at it from, um, yeah, a more accessible point of view. And this is where I landed. Yeah. So, yeah. Solid landing, Brooke. Oh, Solid. <laughs> Um, from someone that loves print, I am known to go to a news agents and just pat the front covers. Like <laughs> I love the feeling of print and um, care just, it's beautiful. It has these uh, little grooves um, in the cover. Um, if someone purchases it, you'll feel those. And I'm just sitting here interviewing you, just patting. Um, <laughs> well, more circling around. Uh, yeah. That's really wonderful. Patting when your we- book, Brooke. <laughs> I, I have to tell I have to tell my publisher that because she'll be delighted. We're like, let's try and tie it in, you know, to the to the cover of Slow, but let it be its own thing. So we went with the tree rings, um, but then I talk about ripples in the book, so that kind of tapped into it. But I had not considered, you know, the the sensory experience. That's of, what it is. Yep. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, to change gears just a little bit, I mean, it does obviously connect very closely with with both your books. Do you want to share a little bit about, you know, your personal experience of having children um, and then maybe the flow on of that and how that's linked back to your books? Absolutely. Um, so my kids are 12 and 10 um, and when our daughter was born, I can't believe they're that old actually. <laughs> but when, it goes it, in a flash. It just does blink go. and we miss it. Yeah. Yep. Um, when my daughter was born, I found myself, so I was running a business. I had my own jewelry label. Um, and we had moved to the blue mountains and, uh, my husband worked insanely long hours in Sydney. So like, you know, my days were kind of spent alone trying to juggle a newborn with running a business with a house that we were renovating with, you know, Ben only kind of being at home during the weekends. Um, and motherhood was not what I expected it to be in that I never had that immediate experience of like falling madly in love with my daughter. I loved her obviously and would do anything for her to protect her. But um, there was always something sort of blocking me maybe and I found myself I was just angry all the time you know she wouldn't sleep I was angry she wouldn't feed I was angry um and it wasn't until our son was born 20 months later uh because I was crazy obviously um that I realized uh that my experience of motherhood first time around was not the only way for it to be because I was quite um content and joyful when Tobes was born and I realized and that only lasted for about six weeks um, but I, I recognized that you know perhaps there was something else at play um, and it you know I found myself talking to my reflection in the mirror saying how much I hated myself and you know it was it was then that I'm like actually I don't necessarily know that this is what it needs to be like. And I, you know, spoke to my husband about it and, um, you know, went and got help and I was fortunate that I was able to get help and was diagnosed with severe postnatal depression and put on antidepressants. And, you know, I spent years with a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And um, it was through that experience that I discovered the idea of simplifying life and slowing down. My psychiatrist actually said to me one day when I was complaining to her about like how busy I was um, and how, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't stop and enjoy life. I couldn't stop and enjoy parenthood because, you know, life was too full and too hard and um, how dare I, how dare she suggest that, you know, I, yeah. I do anything other than push through. And she's like, she said to me, would you ever consider doing less, you know, and simplifying your life? And I was mad at her for that suggestion because I had never come across 
the idea before. It was, you know, you just keep swimming, you just keep pushing. And I went home and I Googled how do I simplify my life and came across, you know, minimalism blogs and simplicity blogs. And that's really where the whole process started. So it was about 10 years ago that I started to think about what it would look like if I did do what she had suggested, which was to try and do a little less and try and, uh, you know, be a little more content with what I had. And I probably blogged about it, to be honest, for five or six years and started to find that there was, there's a lot of people who had similar experiences of parenthood, um, of discontentment with, you know, what modern life is sold to us as. And from there, I started to kind of formulate more of my own ideas and, and the book slow particularly came from that. And I share a lot of my own, you know, my own story in, in that. Um, and as I said about loneliness, you know, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff because so often there'll be someone listening or someone in the audience or someone in the conversation that I'm having who will be like, oh yeah, me too. You know? And I think it's, I just think it's important to go there. It is. Um, just so often we're, we've just got this idea that busy equals successful and to just to sit on the couch and enjoy a magazine or read a book, you know, that you feel guilty for doing that. Absolutely. There really is no rhyme or reason, is there? Like we, you need to let your body heal and and not be switched on 24 seven. Um, Well, I mean, it's diminishing returns if we try to, because at some point you will burn out, you know, if you continue to burn the candle at both ends and the middle, like you will burn out, you'll run out of wax pretty quick. Uh, And And it's not a good feeling. It's not a good feeling. (laughs) And I'm, I'm not, there is, I'm someone who has written about slow living and I've still managed to burn out after it's like, it happens. It's fine. There are times where life just is too much, you know, and you're doing your best and you still burn out. And that's, that's okay. That's not a failure. But I think that if we keep hiding it or feeling ashamed about it, then it becomes this more deeply ingrained problem in our society and in our communities. Yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah. Now you sort of suffered some burnout from the book tour of your last one, Mm -hmm. Slow. So what tools are you sort of bringing out this time, launching into the book tour for care? It's another really good question. And I just keep coming back to an an idea that I have lent so heavily on over the years, which is this idea of tilting. Uh, and I, I kind of coined it in opposition to the phrase work-life balance. Oh, I have love it. I have no time for that idea, you know, this myth that we're sold, (laughs) that if you just try hard enough, you will somehow land on a balanced life where every important part of your life gets equal amounts of your time and energy or the right amounts of your time and energy every day. And look at you, you know, you're balancing. But to me, you think about like literally the act of balancing, so much of your energy goes into staying upright that you're yep. not really paying attention to what's happening around you. So instead of that, I tilt and I tilt hard into wherever I need to be in that moment. And I acknowledge that while I'm tilting into whatever it is that's in front of me, I'm tilting away from everything else. And that's basically my mantra going into the book tour is to tilt. Uh, and it's, I guess another way of explaining it is compartmentalizing things. You know, if I'm I'm talking to you right now, that's it. I'm only talking to you. I'm not cleaning the house. I'm not with my kids. I'm not, you know, with my husband. I'm not working in, on an article I need to write. Like I'm just here and that's okay because once you and I finish talking, I can then move on to what else needs my attention. And I just think that there's a lightness, you know, to that approach that typically tends to help when there's a lot going on, a lot of moving parts in life. Yeah. Well, I love the phrase that you've coined, tilting. Uh, I listened to that this morning, actually. I listened to your podcast that um, you and your husband, Ben, do. Um, and it was called The Impromptu Hostful, I think. And yes. um, it was brilliant. It was really, really good. Usually um, 
I can sort of fade out every now and then with a podcast and my mind just wanders, but yeah, um, yeah totally in on that one. Um, so, you know, maybe if someone's listening to this podcast, make sure you go and um, yeah, add on Brooks as well. Uh, what's it called, Brooke? The, oh, slow- the Slow Home Podcast. Slow Home. Absolutely yeah. love it. To wrap us up, uh, there is a question that I ask all our guests and that is to tell us about a friend of yours that we need to know about. This is a tricky question because I want to say all of them. <laughs> we spoke about this before and I'm like, I don't want to leave anyone out. Um, but the person who came to mind first is someone I actually spoke to on the podcast recently. Her name's Emily Ellers and she um, is on Instagram as Eco with M. She is an illustrator and an activist and just an all-round environmental warrior and she brought a book out in May called Hope is a Verb and it's so beautiful. I love the way her brain works. Actually, you would too because I feel like I'm kindred spirits with M. She makes all of these hilarious pop culture references in her illustrations um, but then pairs them up with, you know, really earnest, sincere, um, you know, advice on how to live hopefully in the world. And to me, that is a, a book, that's a story, that's a, an idea that we all need at the moment because I don't know about you, but there are times and there have been times and there probably will be times over the coming weeks and months where it feels hard to be hopeful. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so M is an absolute gem of a human being. And I well, think, yeah. I'll definitely add that to my book stack. Um, but for the interim care is on my bedside table, Brooke. Um, Just those little small acts at the end of each chapter, um, you know, I really want to work through those and and tick some of those off. Look, if someone hasn't purchased this, it's absolutely beautiful. I think I just love books that are beautiful as well. Um, You know, there are some of us that like styling things. So, (laughs) you know, it's always got bonus points. Um, But uh, look, you are in the Southern Highlands, Uh, in the lovely New South Wales. Um, We're down here in Vic. I hope that you do get to to, tour our part of of the world. Uh, But otherwise, enjoy the book tour. I think it's going to be incredibly successful. Um, I just think it's what we need. It really is what we need at the moment. So lovely, Kimberly. Thank you. And providing COVID plays nice, I will be, I will be touring. I'm going to put it out there. I will be touring (laughs) in July. (laughs) positive thinking I love it I love it thanks so much Brooke pleasure thank you now before you take off with all that inspiration and knowledge we'd love for you to leave a review on our podcast so that we can continue to amplify women's voices in the media and if you have any questions we'd like to celebrate a win you can always connect with us on Facebook and Instagram at Oak Magazine AU I'm so glad we've met and that now you know a friend of mine